Hello, my name is Wolfgang Marx, and I'm very happy to address you on the topic of Tears in Heaven, the Music of Grief. I'm grateful to Bianca Temesh for inviting me to give this little talk as part of the third Ligeti Festival Transylvania, and I'm also grateful for her to organize with this festival and indeed for initiating the entire festival series and this year's conference, which is entitled Thanatos in Contemporary Music from the Tragic to the grotesque. And as part of that, I thought I'd talk a bit about the general terms in which music and death interact, in which music reacts to death or engages with death. And uh, that is particularly Western music, because as we shall see, music is not necessarily a universal in that respect. Death is one of the crucial components of the human condition. Its inevitability, as well as the uncertainty of its time of arrival, are defining components of life. According to Martin Heidegger, our existence is shaped by a constant state of anticipation, what he calls being towards death, or in German, Sein zum Tode. An awareness of and worrying about the finality of our current state of being and whatever may follow it. According to Heidegger, the existence and inevitability of death, paired with the uncertainty regarding its time of arrival, is what makes life so valuable to us. If we live forever, or even if we knew we still had a very long time ahead until we eventually have to die, there would be much less pressure to get things done. Yet if time is a finite resource, its value automatically increases to argue in a quasi-economical fashion. Music has always played an important part in mankind's engagement with death. It forms a central part of death rituals in different cultures. It helps consoling survivors as well as celebrating the memory of the deceased. I would like, and at this point I think I'm going to start sharing my slides, I would like to uh, engage with music and death by first talking about um, the functions that music can have in relation to death, then the structures that at least Western music uh, generally tends to show when it engages with death, and then look at a few examples of how this actually works then in uh, detail, or how theoretical concepts have been developed to structure these uh, research. So I would like to start with three core questions that I think are very good starting points to approach this issue. They are actually derived from the questions that Philip Tack asked in an article that I will come to in a while, but that I have uh, rephrased and restructured a bit. What is or what are the music's main functions, be it as part of ritual or ceremony or in other contexts that relate to death? How is the music structured and how do structure and function interact and reinforce each other? So structure and function are the two core components there. And who's involved in producing or performing the music and who's primarily addressed by it? This is particularly relevant with regard to uh, the question of whether these people are personally affected. Are you dealing with a death, a personal loss of maybe a relative, a beloved? And if not, are you, is it something you were commissioned to write or maybe is it written for a concert hall where people pay for a ticket to listen to it and are themselves also not personally affected by a loss? Or is it for the mourners? So that's relevant as well. And three, these three core questions we can have in the back of our minds for all that will follow. Martin Lodge has uh, proposed a number of core functions or categories of death-related music. And these are the ones listed here. There is celebration of the beyond and our religious affirmation. And he lists as examples uh, music by Bach or by Messiaen that does that. Then there's imaginative prediction and prophecy. That is trying to anticipate what dying or what afterlife might be like. Uh, Strauss, death and transfiguration would be an example of that. There's death and love. So that is uh, Tristan and Isolde as a core example comes spring to mind. Uh, so how death and love interact and how very often dying uh, on behalf of the beloved or uh, for the beloved is uh, maybe the ultimate proof of your love. Fear of death is an obvious thing um, that is uh, also expressed in music. So for instance, in Dies era sections of Requiems, you have a lot of that when it comes to the first person narrative in the middle of it. 
sadness and loss. So it's not about your own death that you anticipate or fear or try to uh, imagine. It's how to react to having lost somebody close to you. And then music of mourning and requiems. And uh, that is uh, more formal things. Whereas sadness and loss for Lodge means that it's about uh, singing, playing, composing music because you yourself are affected by a loss. Whereas in the category music of mourning and requiems, he more kind of concentrates music that is uh, written not by people personally affected or not performed by people personally affected, but it's more uh, commission, for instance, or it's, uh, uh, it's a job. Now, Lodge himself uh, is uh, uh, careful about uh, being not too rigid with his thing. He says such a taxonomy like these points can never be the last word on a subject, but it can provide a useful starting point for clarifying and organizing information. That is the intention with the present proposal regarding composers' responses to death. So it is all very often the case that these functions or categories would overlap. And uh, it is very often the case also that um, more than two of them overlap, maybe even several. And the, uh, it's also the case that if you have a long piece of music, not just a song, like an opera, like a requiem, that there is an epic or dramatic narrative, that there are moments of joy or moments of very different emotions that build on each other and respond to each other, so that you have moments of different elements here in one piece of music. And I don't know about you, but when I first saw this, uh, I, my immediate response was, of course, like probably everybody's, I would do that differently, slightly differently or massively differently, even though I think it's a very good starting point. So I added a few, I think, that are also relevant. Uh, that's the first one, necropolitical critique of deaths or those responsible for deaths. Necropolicy, ne necropolitics, is a relatively recent term that comes from uh, post-colonial studies, where it says, ultimately, whoever holds the power of putting people to death or letting them live, uh, pursues what is called necropolitics. And in colonial context, these are, of course, the colonial masters. But in many other contexts, this term, I think, can be used as well and has now been used. And um, so that is relevant, uh, particularly in the 20th century, in music from the 20th century, as we discuss it at this conference. Um, because very often, these musics related to death accuse or critique circumstances that led to the deaths of many, like the Holocaust, for example or other um, uh, wars. Then, uh, as a next example, there is death desired, not just feared. Because there are actually cases in literature and then in music where death is desired. We can think of the Flying Dutchman, who is cursed to forever sail the ocean until he finds a woman that stays true, faithful to him until his death. And he's desperate to find her. He wants to die. He's tired of living forever. This is actually a trope in literature. Uh, there's quite a few examples of that where people somehow gain immortality and then try very hard to get rid of it after some time. Uh, the Macropolis case by Janacek is another example where Emilia Marti, as she's called in the opera, she is also known under other names but always under the same initials, uh, had um, gained not immortality but very long life, which she can uh, prolong by uh, drinking a certain potion. And she at some point decides not to uh, drink it anymore because she too doesn't want to live anymore. So there are cases where death is desired and there are musics that engage uh, with these cases. And I would subdivide the last point, focus on mourning, focus on celebration and commemoration of persona and achievements. And that is maybe making clearer that distinction that Lodge makes between sadness and loss personally and music of mourning and requiems. Because even those more formal compositions like a requiem, um, there can be more personal aspects to it of the mourning. Um, so we need to um, console those who experience the loss. But you can also say we want, and mainly addressing not the mourners then, but others, we want to focus on celebrating or commemorating a persona. It's the, the king is dead, long live the king, as a moment, as it were. Uh, so I say Verdi's, for instance, Verdi's Requiem for um, 
Manzoni, uh, I think has aspects of that. Yeah, we are sad that he died, but we also want to celebrate and commemorate how great the person this was. And so we do that with a piece of music as well. Now let's move on to structural issues. And this is the article by Philip Tack that I mentioned earlier, uh, where he, uh, he did a little experiment. And this is not a statistically valid experiment, as he himself stresses oh, again and again. He asked people he uh, had encountered at a conference, he played them a few pieces of music and asked them what's the general topic, the general emotion that this is related to. He didn't tell them what it was. And um, that was actually, um, he did that twice. He did that with non-European music and with European music. He started with the non-European music, but we start with the European music where he then isolated five components, as you can see here, uh, that um, are typical, he says, of Western funereal music. These are minor key, low volume, slow tempo, restricted ambitus and short repetitive phrases, and low tessitura and descending movement. And he has several examples of that. I'm going to play one. The second movement of Brahms, a German Requiem, then Alles Fleisch ist wie Gras, for all flesh it is like grass. And I think that beautifully combines all of these aspects. And I suspect uh, this is pretty obvious that these five categories are very common in Western funeral music. There's not much discussion about that. Um, he, however, also, uh, and in, as I said, initially presented uh, his um, group of people with non-Western funeral music. So he doesn't actually quite exactly identify what it was. He gives a general description. So I have here two examples that um, I think at least uh, are probably not exactly the examples, but uh, they are at least in this category. This is um, Western African people, the Senufo, women singing at a hunter's funeral. <laughs> Exactly. Unfortunately, this was the wrong one. Um, this was the turkey one. So this is the one I want. Sorry about that. It starts <laughs> And now 
of the Turkish one. So, uh, as I said, um, Tag played this to his audience. It was in Sweden, so it was a Western audience. And he didn't tell them it was about death. He told them it was, there's a shared topic to all the seven, eight examples he played. Um, it's something we all experience. It's something that all affects us all. It comes from different regions of the world. What do you think it is? And no one came up with death. Because it doesn't follow those five tropes that we in the West are familiar with. Uh, they have their own structures that we are not familiar with and they are different for each culture. Uh, that's what this shows us. So he concludes that death or music or both must be treated as culturally specific and not as universal phenomena. However, it still holds true that A, all societies have music and B, that all mortals die. This contradiction means in turn that death and music are universal and cultural specific at the same time. And that we shall, there, shall therefore need to clarify the ways in which music or death or both are not universal. So that's not what I'm going to try in this talk. I'm going to focus on Western uh, music, although probably the functions I think might be uh, more universal, like, uh, unlike the structures that are more specific to Western music. Now, there are a number of symbols of death that are pretty easily recognizable, Am I, again, that was sorry again um, amongst Western audiences, at least within the same cultural sphere. Um, there are quotations from the Gregorian chant of the Requiem Mass, the Requiem Eternum, in particular, the Dies Era, and another one would be the Funeral March. These are occurring across different uh, regions, countries, across different uh, periods, so they are uh, generally recognizable. There are more specific cases of motifs, musical motifs or symbols, as we might call them, of death that are used by just individual composers and perhaps even only in individual pieces by some composers. And I have two examples here, Schubert's use of a specific rhythm and Dvorak's Requiem, which I will go to in a moment. Just to uh, look at some examples here, uh, the Requiem Eternum, at the beginning of the uh, Requiem Mass, let's listen to that. So that is um, pretty well known, I think, and it is used in composed music then uh, in order to indicate this. We have here as an example, uh, the French composer André Campra, the beginning of his Requiem, which is written, was written around 1723 or a bit later. And listen to the bass line there. Then the next example is the Dies Irae. That is probably the best known 
uh, symbol motif related to death in music. That is first the Gregorian original again. Sorry, um, that is again not the one I wanted, the Gregorian. So that's the original. Uh, that is quoted a lot, much more often than the Requiem Eternum uh, motif in a lot of different musics. And I have selected here uh, the third of the four songs and dances of death by Mussorgsky. I thought it's interesting to take a Russian example because the um, liturgy of death, the Western liturgy doesn't apply to the Orthodox Church. So this doesn't mean anything to Mussorgsky liturgically. It had already by the time he wrote this in the 1870s become a general sort of symbol of death in music so that he used it. And it's only the first four notes that very ominously are dropped in by the piano in this piece. So let's listen to the beginning, just the opening of this song. there's the funeral march and uh, that is something again that is very common in different styles and different periods by different composers. Um, I have picked here Beethoven's uh, Eroica Symphony in the second movement which is one of the most famous uh, funeral marches. Um, the, the example of that uh, Philip Dack used is the, possibly the one that is the most famous altogether uh, which is uh, from Chopin's be my now uh, piano sonata, uh, but let's listen to this funeral march here. <laughs> the third example. So with any of these musical tropes, when people hear them in a Western context, I think most people instantly recognize this is... The next um, example is the more individual one, where individual composers pick something that is not that commonly used. And a good example here is the dactylic rhythm that Schubert uses when he refers to death. And uh, the dactylic rhythm means uh, long, short, short. And there are two songs that are particularly related to death where these uh, two, uh, this, this rhythm occurs very prominently in the term of, of, of as a minimum and crotch and crotchet or half note, quarter note, quarter note. The first one, Der Tod und das Mädchen, Death and the Maiden, where is the basic rhythm. So this is actually specific to death. When death sings, we hear that rhythm. And in fact, the melodic line of death is also set in that rhythm. The girl is not accompanied by that rhythm. 
The other example is uh, from Winterreise, uh, song number 21, Das Wirtshaus, the inn, uh, where the wanderer, the wary wanderer, encounters a cemetery and he regards this cemetery as an inn and considers, can I stay here and which means of course, can, can I die and rest here because that's what I'm longing for. So let's listen to this. And the next example uh, is one I want to spend a bit more time on because A, I just recently published something about it and B, um, it is I think a very good example of an epic or dramatic development of a motif. So it's not always mourning and sadness throughout the piece and that is uh, the Requiem by Antonin Dvorak. And the Requiem features, the Requiem features what you can already hear there a motif. Listen to it. Stop that here because you get the principle, it's those five notes, <clears throat> and they are very specific. They are very easily recognizable. And what do they do? It looks almost, it starts on a note, it ends on the same note. It looks as if uh, the melody tries to get away from that central pitch. It tries to go up, it tries to go down, but it falls back to the central pitch. And these attempts to get away are very weak because it's the smallest possible interval that exists, the semitone, it goes up a semitone below. And um, it is, I think in many ways, and a musical expression of the other, otherness, with a capital O as sociologists use it, uh, something that's outside our own sphere. It is chromatic because you normally don't have two semitones in a row in any Western scale, really. You, uh, it is, at least for a moment, rhythmically ambiguous because it, they use that it is, um, uh, the syncopation for a moment makes you confused about uh, um, what the what the time signature might be it's very clear very soon but still um it's it's ambiguous about the key as well because if there is a single melodic line unaccompanied and it has a central note you probably suspect it would be the root that is that central pitch but it isn't we are in b flat minor and uh, the f is the fifth so we start on the fifth and that is also confusing later on when you realize this is actually not the root um, and it is most of the time, not always, most of the time presented by instruments, not the voices. And it is also a lot of the time unaccompanied like we just heard it there. So it really stands out. It is different. And it is very prominent. It's uh, returning again and again and again. Um, let's listen to another version of it that is actually in a later movement of the gradual, the opening of the gradual. So that was again at the end there, uh, the motif. Uh, so now it is in the voice, but it is still actually unaccompanied. The accompaniment only comes in after that phrase, those five notes are done. 
And so uh, we have throughout the Requiem up to the offertory, the end of the Hostia section, this motto coming up and up uh, again and again and again uh, in virtually all movements. However, when we get to the Sanctus and to the last three movements, Sanctus Pi Jesu and Agnus Dei of this Requiem, we encounter something new that we haven't heard before. And let's listen to the Sanctus. I'm interested in the first four notes, F, B flat, B flat, F. And you can see there's, again, this is four notes, not five, but it has starts and ends on the same note. It has a leap down, not up, and it is a leap, not a step, but it gets, goes in one direction. It goes into the other direction. It goes back to the original, but it is far more energetic. It is far more positive as it were, I think because of the larger leaps and positive because the leap between the two middle notes is going up, not down. And um, I think it is still related. It is de derived from the original motto. It is, however, accompanied. It is not, stand, it doesn't stand alone. It is part of a longer melodic line. The uh, original motto always is a phrase on its own. It doesn't really work as part of something else. Now, if this happened only once, this four note motif, you could say this is coincidental, this is not a specific strategic idea or so. But if we go to the next movement, the Pia Jesu, look and listen to uh, how this starts. something very similar at the beginning again on different pitches d g g and d and then the uh, this last uh, leap from g down to d is filled uh, with uh, passing notes but it's the same principle it goes down a fifth it goes up an octave and it goes down to the original pitch and um, so there seems to be some kind of compositional strategy here However, what's also interesting is if you look at the fifth bar of this example, D, E flat, C sharp, D, there's the motto, the original motto creeping in again. So it doesn't leave this new version, which I call the counter motto, because it seems to have a more positive attitude and is more integrated. It's like the other is being changed, what was the original other, to be integrated into normal proceedings, as it were. But it's never going to get too far away from the original motto. And if we look at the beginning of the last movement, the Agnus Dei, let's listen to this. Again, have those four pitches, the same as in the PDA, so at the first four pitches of the Agnus Dei. It's a bit sort of more complex because the motif is only three notes long and then it's varied, but still the four, four opening pitches are identical, D, G, G, D, to the one in the PDA. So, uh, so clearly we have this idea of a, uh, as a, of a derivation of the original motto, what I call the counter motto, very much present, not just at the beginning, by the way, of these three movements, but later on as well. But we also have the original motto, we all have heard that in the Agnus Dei as well, not being silent, being there as well. So later on in the Agnus Dei, the final movement, we get another version, 
another derivation, what I call a diatonic variant of the original motto. Uh, and we have here, uh, the, you can see it here, Agnus Dei, the example I picked actually to play to you is on a different text, we have Pius S, because um, that is the most triumphant version and of this uh, diatonic variant. Let's at least see where I find this. Um, that is actually a bit later here. This is, however, actually the last time any variant of this motto, any counter motto appears, because at the end of this movement, at the end of the entire Requiem, the original motto reasserts its authority, as it were, and the piece ends, well, that's exactly the way it started, with the original presentation of that motto, and we listen to that now, just the final minute of this piece. Um, So clearly the motto wins out. The diatonic variant, I call it diatonic because it doesn't use a chromatic note. Uh, the difference to the motto is, of course, A, we have uh, the central pitch inserted in the middle. Uh, the rhythm is different as well. Uh, and also we have uh, major seconds either way uh, of the central note, not minor seconds. And that uh, in a diatonic uh, way, therefore. I think this is also a much more positive attitude that this integrated version of the, um, of the motto um, exudes, but it's not to last. It only exists uh, for part of the last movement and, uh, and then doesn't take over. So overall, I think one could read this as a motto which is firmly established until the end of the Hostia section, the Offertorium, is then challenged from the Sanctus onwards, but is never fully replaced by the counter motto over the course of the last three movements. The diatonic variant, this one we just played, in the last movement may be regarded as a compromise proposal. It's not quite the motto, but it's also not quite a counter motto. Yet at the end, the original motto wins out. So in a broader sense, you might even say that death, which is represented as the ultimate other of humankind, of life, and we can be pretty certain of that, that this mo uh, motto means death because uh, um, Dvorak used it before in a song, at the end of the song, where it is clearly tied to death. And then he imported it into this work. So, um, and then this is a challenge to it that is ultimately not successful. Death remains the ultimate musical and real other to us, to humankind, to life. Now, this is a reading that I propose as a possible and hopefully plausible one. I can't say, and I don't know whether Dvorak actually intended that. To my knowledge, there's nothing he said about this. So I'm not claiming this was the intention of the composer, but I do think this counter motto, this version is there, it's very obvious, and uh, it needs to be attached to some kind of meaning. So uh, that is an important thing we'll come to back to later as well. We need to distinguish between intentional things that we can isolate and identify and reception. And I'm only saying this is based on reception. Now let's move on to a few 
proposals by different writers about uh, the role of music in relation to death. And the first one is a psychoanalytical one by a German writer, Sebastian Leichert, who has developed an idea about what he calls aesthetic thanatology. And he says, regarding music as aesthetic thanatology, means that one can look at music as a human being's attempt to know about death what is knowable about death. However, music is no philosophical thanatology. Its knowledge of death is not available in the form of sentences or hypotheses. Music is an aesthetic thanatology, that is, it offers opportunity to approach death through experiences, aesthetic knowledge. Music is an attempt to resist the experience of death through different types of living. And later on he says, we exist, but we don't necessarily live. There are feelings of loss, of joie de vivre, and we require love and music to overcome them. We love music because it loves what is dead in us, because it is able to recreate moments of pain, desperation, and the loss of joie de vivre, to incorporate them into our essential continuum, which we need in order to feel alive. The pure arrows of music consists of recreating the emotional death-related landscapes of the soul in its emotional relief and thus to liberate them from their autistic isolation. So in a way he says, music can have a cathartic function and music can make us uh, get to grips with um, the experience of loss and particularly by uh, getting us to engage with others. Uh, music is usually a communal activity, music involves more than one person and by getting involved in music, making music, but even listening to music, um, we sort of engage with the people who make the music and who make it together with us, ideally. Um, so music has at heart a cathartic function, although he doesn't work, use the term, I think that's what he's after. And then there are others who um, approach uh, a similar idea from different angles. Uh, Michael Grover Friedlander, when she talks about operatic afterlives, uh, and says the omnipresence of death is not just a matter of opera's plots. In opera, more than anything, an intimate association is established between singing and death. The climax of singing is the most extreme form of being towards death. That's a reference to Heidegger, as I said in my introduction, who uses this term as becoming aware of your mortality, but also of sort of uh, surviving. There are cases in operas that uh, she discusses where a voice survives the death of the speaker and is used later on. Nowadays, of course, we have recordings, but in those operas, it's even that the voice comes, but one doesn't know from the afterlife or is still alive somehow. And uh, otherwise, so the, the, the acoustic uh, sphere is still uh, alive with that being that is otherwise lost. And there is um, Linda and Michael Hutchins' approach. And this is still, I think, the best cover ever chosen for a book on music and death. Um, let me just actually move my, so they see the full picture here. This is actually from an operatic performance of Verdi's in Balo and Mascara uh, at the Bregenz Opera Festival, uh, where in, they have the stage floating in Lake Constance. And this is a picture from that production. So they talk about the Orpheus myth and the Orpheus operas, and particularly Monteverdi. And they suggest that Orpheus operas have offered their audiences a structural narrative of loss and bereavement that acts out a ritual of mourning, often followed by a fantasy escape. And that is, uh, and they continue with that, upon his second loss, Orpheus realizes the truth of his situation, that nothing, no amount of praying, weeping, and sighing will bring the dead back. Such is the human condition. What his song can and will do is voice his pain and pine grief to himself to nature, to the obliging, consoling echo, and of course to the audience. This is what mourning rituals allow, a living through pain and a learning to grieve. So again, this is a cathartic function. And they say you go through different stages of grief. They don't mention Kubler-Ross, but it's almost a bit like that. Um, so Orpheus is steer from the beginning uh, that, that she's not going to come back. And this is not what this is all about. Uh, it is more about offering the audience the chance to go along with that and for themselves learn that this is the case and maybe see an example of how one can go through these different stages. And again, they don't say that, but it's the same thing. It's, we, it's not a claim that Monteverdi had 
Kubler-Ross in mind when he wrote this or something like that. It is a reading from today's point of view, but a reading that is plausible and uh, makes sense from today's point of view. And since we are the ones dealing with it, listening to it now, we have to make sense for ourselves uh, of all this. Then there is uh, Laurie Surpe's book, Death and Winter Rise, Music of Poetic Associations in Schubert's Song Cycle, which I think offers a very sophisticated and very convincing way of trying to link function and structure and find a way to analyze them separately and then link the results of those analysis. He analyzes the last 11 songs of this cycle based on the fact that he says, um, to me, this is where it turns from grieving about what's lost and trying to hope to get it back towards accepting that it's lost and now sort of uh, trying to find and, and getting more acquainted with death. And he analyzes the songs musically based on Robert Hatton's expressive genres, particularly the uh, tropes of joyful and tragic music, and so identified which sections of the music are one or the other. And then he analyzes separately the text based on Algeras Grimas' purely structural method of binary oppositions, where you distinguish things like an acting subject and a desired object and a sender and a receiver. And then he brings that together and finds that these very often fit together very well, uh, finds equivalences between those. And this is a very uh, good way, I think, very convincing way of uh, doing this. We have to keep in mind when talking about this, uh, two other points, uh, which I already hinted at in some contexts, um, intention and reception. So what did the composer intend? What did people at the time make of a piece and what did it mean in its respective historical context? As musicologists, we want to know that we uh, are after that. But we also want to know how does it speak to us today? And ultimately that's probably more important to us and to audiences. Well, what does it have to say to us? Although this is of course uh, informed and should be informed by what the intention was, but is very often not exactly the same. And then there's direct and indirect ways to address uh, the, uh, the audience. So uh, there's often the case addressing the audience by pretending to address someone else. Orpheus again would be an example of that. Orpheus interacts with the people around him but of course, ultimately, this is meant to address us. Um, there's a direct addressing that is often more unconscious or emotional, or an indirect addressing that may require some reflective activity. And I think, for instance, my Dvorak example with the way in, way in which these mottos change and evolve might be one of those, uh, at least if my reading is acceptable. Let us now return to the initial core, three core questions. What is or are the music's main functions? Uh, be it as part of ritual ceremony or in other contexts. We've seen lodges uh, um, proposals of functions um, and uh, the way uh, I try to expand them a bit. We've um, seen Lycas proposal that's helping us to live with our mortality through creating or reinforcing a joie de vivre, the, the, the enjoyment of life. It can represent or thus demonstrate stages of grief and provide a cathartic experience as the Hutchins propose. There's another book by Maria Sismic um, that talks about cultural trauma, music and cultural trauma, which is very often related to death, but as expressed in relation not to an individual, but to a people, to a group like uh, um, um, African-Americans and slavery, like uh, Jews after the Holocaust. Um, things like that, uh, to which individuals respond, but they respond as part of a group. And there's a lot of music about that too. And there's, we just uh, looked at direct and indirect way of addressing characters and audiences. The second question, how is music structured? How do structure and function interact and reinforce each other? We've seen those five characteristics of Western funeral music, which are culturally specific. We can't say they are the same everywhere on the planet, let alone off the planet. Uh, we have seen there are some general musical symbols of death in Western music, and there are some more specific ones used by individual composers or just in individual compositions. We have to keep in mind in relation to all that, that it's uh, often a dramatic or epic development within a larger piece like an opera or a requiem or a symphony. Uh, and then we need uh, more complex ways to analyze them, like, for instance, proposed by Surpe in his semiotic analysis of the Winter songs, or indeed uh, how I looked at the development of the motto in Dvorak's Requiem. 
And finally, who's involved in producing, performing the music and who's primarily addressed by it. We have to keep in mind there again, what's intentional, uh, what was the intention, what is the reception and how do these match or maybe not. Um, historically and today that is related to it, um, things that meant different things maybe 100, 200, 300 years ago than they do today in general terms. Is it religious? Is it secular? Uh, very often Requiem's compositions, the majority of them written in the 20th century, is secular, even if they use the traditional liturgical text or parts of it or mix it with something else. The way in which the audience is addressed directly or indirectly, direct addressing is often perceived as a bit didactic and not so well taken. Indirect is far more effective very often. And is it about individual or collective identities? Is it about the individual loss or is it uh, particularly in macro-political context, is it a real thing? Um, for instance, like um, Britain's uh, war requiem does, the, the um, folly and the um, loss, uh, losses incurred in war, you look at that from individual points of view, but we talk about the collective experience of it. And that is also important to distinguish in relation to whatever music you look at. So in conclusion then, I think we can say that all categories or taxonomies uh, are ideal types. They are never really in, in, in real life one-on-one uh, -on -one clickable. They are always mix, uh, mixing of uh, different categories, but it's still good for analytical purposes. Now, a piece of music can have many functions at the same time. It can have shares in several categories, even structural ones. And music that engages with grief often simultaneously fulfills other functions as well. Uh, not just grieving and mourning, but also celebrating or, uh, the memory, trying to provide the cathartic experience or trying to revive the joie de vivre, as Leikert puts it. And this is, uh, I think, um, to come finally to explain the title of my talk, Tears in Heaven, which of course refers to the Eric Clapton song. But what I wanted to indicate there is regularly there are tears in the music, but there's very often heaven too, and much else. Uh, it's much more complex, particularly if it's a more complex piece of music. And that is a thought that I would like to conclude with. Thank you very much for your attention.